Paula Vogel's Pulitzer Prize winning play, How I Learned to Drive, was going to have its Broadway premiere this year. Then came the pandemic. While the fate of that premiere remains unknown, Vogel has been putting her energies into the worldwide stage, the Internet. She's launched Bard at the Gate, an online series of play readings featuring works that have been largely overlooked. James Killingworth appears. He moves with purpose, but he is yet jovial and radiant, the prime actor. Always the midnights, isn't it, Margaret? The plot to rob me of my slumber soon I look as old as you for the want of it. Oh, come now, Margaret. Where's your sense of excitement? Paula Vogel, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Jared. So you have created this series presenting us playwrights who have been who haven't very been properly looked at or after right. until right. you've entered the fray here to to give them the exposure that's their due. How long have you been wanting to do this? Uh, about thirty or forty years. Uh, actually, with the first play that I presented, I wanted to do this in nineteen seventy eight. Wow. What was it about this moment that you thought this this was the time to, to bring these artists forward? Everyone in my community loves what they're doing, making theater. And just the kind of ache that I felt not being able to go into the room, be with other people, watch a world being made, um, is, I think, as hard, almost as hard, as the financial worry, as uh, the health worries, and so, for many, many reasons, for me, theater is still something that is important for me to do, but I want to do it as a producer. It seems to me that that's more important. It's just that being stuck in this aid world doesn't give me much of a chance, see? Even though I'm supposed to be one of the same ones, one of the ones close to authority, and yet that's just it. So close, yet so far away. Kind of like I exist only in limbo, only in transit. Like all I can do is look at the script from the outside well, well, speaking of what you've done, the last time I spoke with you on this show, we were talking about indecent, which it becomes truer and truer to our time every second. I'm afraid so. I'm afraid so. And, you know, I, I know that there are a lot of casts that are very disappointed. There are a lot of companies that had to close their productions or never got to open their productions of indecent. Um, it is this moment in time where theater provides the canary in the coal mine, I think. And in that sense, I think art becomes an essential, one becomes an essential worker in this moment of time. Now, going back to your series, what I think is so fabulous about it is that we have seen over the past few months this call to American theater to look in at itself, to look deep inside itself uh, about all of the stories it hasn't been telling for decades, the stories of people of color, not casting people of color, not hiring people of color, not tapping into them to share their stories. And yet here you come and in just a matter of months present a whole season. I know that you're not staging all of them. These are online. But you, 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 you were able to do it very quickly, which I think is telling. Uh I, th I think all of us who love theater love theater because of its diversity. For a very long time, I have been tired of upper middle class whiteness, seeing it and hearing it again and again and again when we watch television shows. So for a very long time, I thought, oh my gosh, I've, I, I've got to go down to the off, off, off Broadway to find these voices who do astonishing things on almost no money for two or three weekends. And I came back completely filled. Um, and one does not see that in institutional theaters. So when I founded my playwriting program, somehow or other, I was very lucky with my colleagues. We raised money so that it was tuition free and, and everyone got a stipend. Were you and Frank ever Lovers? But lovers? You mean as in... Yeah. N no, don't get me wrong. I don't think I'm getting you wrong. Because if you were, it's okay with me. But we weren't. Now, I look at theater the same way we look at our public libraries. The same way we look at schools. It should be free for everybody. And there are ways that we can make theater pay 
through outreach and education, but we've turned our back on that. They've come to a point where they can't raise the money for a new play anymore. What kind of confidence do you have that this is going to change, that the theater makers, while trying to balance capitalism uh, with the audiences who might not go to see something that doesn't have X big name actor, what's your level of confidence that it's going to be able to change in the way that so many people want it to change? We're in an empathy crisis right now. We really are, and we're recognizing that. And that empathy crisis has led to incredible racial injustice that we're watching now every night on our television. How do we form empathy regardless of one's skin color? You form empathy through participating in the arts as a child. You learn to draw, you learn to play an instrument, you learn to listen, you learn to play imaginary characters, you learn to write. So, you know, always I think being a teacher, I, it gives me a kind of long view and maybe it's a delayed gratification, but I'm sure that we will be gratified as this younger generation gets empowered. 25 years I've lived the life of action and I have felt the theatre bend. Now it feels like to break. Mark me well, William. There is no end to theatre. You must have faith. Next up in your series is a play by Issa Davis. Tell me quickly yes. about that. I read Issa Davis's Bull Rusher. I've never seen this play. This is why I have to do this series, Jared. Um, I read it when I was on the Pulitzer jury, and it just blew me away. I felt so happy and hopeful um, and he that there is a healing that can happen in terms of racial division. By the time I got to the end of the play, I was weeping. She makes me walk in someone else's shoes. And to learn that love, to learn what it feels like to be perhaps the only young black woman in a small logging town is an extraordinary gift. And I think she does all three things uh, in an amazing way. Well, and we have to thank you for your part in that. Paula Vogel, I always love talking to you. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Jared, for everything you're doing. Seriously, every time, I just, you know, I just want to get on and bless you. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you so much. Well, I, again, I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thanks so much.